the way you deliver it is you have these two horse ropes that you wrap around the keg and then guide it down a rail. And when, if anybody's ever been to McGillan's, yeah. it's, it's a party there nonstop, no yeah. matter what time of the day. So right now, especially during holiday time, people are coming out and they're like, whoa, what's going on here? And it's like people start videoing me and all this other stuff. It's like, no pressure, don't drop that keg, you know, so. All right, welcome back to the Brewdat Podcast. I'm your host, Richie Tevlin, joined again by Evan Bloom. Uh, and tonight we have, you know, I want to say it, Philadelphia brewing industry legend, John Olt. Hey, hey. 18 plus years in the game um, and currently the head of wholesale distribution at Philadelphia Brewing Company. That's me. How's everybody doing? Doing well. So, yeah, you know, John I've known here. you for, I guess, five years now since I started yeah. at Philadelphia Brewing Company. A um, little bit of a blur, little but, bit of a you blur. know. <laughs> um, but, you know, definitely wanted to have you on, you know, you're like a, a beer man's beer man is what I want to call you. Like, really appreciate that. In the not not just the Philly brewing scene, but the Philly bar scene, you know probably more people than anyone else. You've been in more bars, more basements, more dive bar basements. You've seen it all: the good, the bad, and the ugly. The Philly beer scene. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know that you have a lot of great stories. So wanted to have you on here. And yeah, sure. Let's up. get it started. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, I mean, I guess we had talked about uh, you graduated Temple in 2005. Correct. And kind of got right into Yards, which eventually became Philly Brewing. But, you know, if you just want to start from the beginning. Yeah, so, um, like you said, 18-plus um, years in the beer industry, seen seen a lot, uh, a lot of experience. Um, so, yeah, if we want to start at the beginning, uh, 2005, right around May, I turned 21 and the end of March. So, through kind of just... Kind of fell into it, to be honest. Um, my dad was kind of sick of giving me money to get through college, and uh, he actually met the owners, um, Bill and Nancy Barden, at, uh, well, Cherry Street Tavern. Nice. Uh, Great. Best roast beef in the yes, city, hands that. down. You can fight me for it. <laughs> um, and uh, he, you know, he had gotten talk, you know, got talking to them, and, you know, we're just you know, just happened to find out what they were all about and was like, oh man, can you give my kid an interview? Like, don't hire him. He just needs interview experience. And uh, I went in for the interview and they ended up hiring me and my dad wasn't happy about that. He called them back. He's like, I told you not to hire him. And he's like, the kid's great. Like, we need somebody. So it all worked out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I started there and uh, I'll still, I still remember the first thing that Bill said to me. He was like, you're not afraid to get your hands wet, are you? I was like, no. And like, because everything, you know, in a brewery is wet, whether it's water, beer, chemicals, or whatever. Um, so, it, yeah, just scrubbing floors, cleaning kegs, uh, helping on the bottling line, hopping on a truck when I needed to. And then uh, in right around, you know, 2006, I can't remember the exact time that this happened, but um, Yards was with a wholesaler called uh, Friedland, um, RIP to uh, the Friedland wholesale industry. And um, they had gotten bought out um, by, I believe it was Kunda Beverage. And we saw kind of a little bit of a, uh, a window of opportunity. To, we just, we didn't want to be coupled with another wholesaler. And there was a window of opportunity for us to become a self-distributed -distrib brewery. And nobody was doing that at the time. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, along with scrubbing floors and cleaning kegs and all that stuff. And when I graduated in the summer of 06, they had just finished the litigation with um, the whole, the retaining our wholesale distribution rights. And um, we had just talked to Nick at Stones and like, that's a, you're locked in for life when you're, when you sign one of those deals. So you guys were kind of given a sec second opportunity to see if this was something that you guys wanted to do? Yeah, like I, in, like I said, I had kind of just started there. So I'd, it's not like I was in the courtroom or anything yeah. like that, but uh, I don't know all the details of, of that whole situation. But we were able to get out of, you know, since one wholesaler was buying another one, it was like, you know, they could, I don't know how it worked out. Anyway, you, but you know. you guys got out. So we got out, and now all of a sudden we're, we're doing everything directly with our own trucks, our own salespeople. Um, so we had a great name in the city and then the surrounding aspect of it too. So I grew up in the Northeast in Fox Chase and then um, went to LaSalle College High School in um, 
you know, the early 2000s. And, you know, so it was up kind of in like the Montgomery County, Bucks County area, just kind of where I was, you know, so I was a lot more familiar with what was going on up yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had gone to Temple and then, you know, was working at the brewery, but I wasn't hanging out in North Philly, you know, and, and Fishtown slash I mean, Kensington was, was not what it is today. Was for sure not what it is now. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was only a few spots you could go that was, you know, let alone safe, but had good craft beer. And, um, so, you know, rewind back a little bit, but it was, so they come to me and it was like, I graduated and they're like, well, we need an on the road salesperson. And I was, I jumped at it and it was just like, man, things just keep falling into place here. Um, so I jumped in my car that my brother gave me for my graduation. It was a, a used, uh, Volkswagen Corrado <laughs> with six speed. Or, uh, six cylinders and it was very fast and I was 21 and zipping around like bar visits per day. all over <laughs> yeah it was just like a ridiculous amount of, of driving and all over the place so um, that's where I really cut my teeth was with the, the whole self distribution thing um, so people were real excited about the fact that they could buy directly from us because they could get the beer there was no there was no middleman markup so mm -hmm. they could get the beer cheaper than what they had paid before and we were making more money because we didn't have to sell it to the wholesaler. Cheaper, and there's, it's also it's kind of cool to, to let's get say less right expensive, from, less expensive, and cheaper doesn't like, more. <laughs> you know, there is a middleman, like they're making the beer and it's getting delivered right to the bar. That's there's right. something kind of cool about that as well. Right. Yeah. So that's what we kind of based everything off of was that self distribution motto. Um, we made shirts up one time that says "Use the ring, we bring," and uh, we always thought that was pretty funny. So yeah, it was this whole, you know, factory direct thing and people were really jumping behind it and really just put our whole muscle into all of that. Which is very cool. I mean, I think a lot of the people that we're going to have on here, yeah, we talk about self-distribution. They just kind of take it for granted. In 2005, 2006, that wasn't a thing. Like you guys were no. kind of creating that as you were going. Yeah. I, I mean, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, out there, if we weren't some of the first ones to do it, if not the first one in this area, Definitely, but, I would, but we really, I um, you know, we really went for it and, mm -hmm. and it was successful. We had, you know, for the most, for the majority of the part, you know, people really gravitated towards it. Some people were old school and they were like, well, I only buy from these wholesalers or whatever. So, and you know, that took a lot, just a little bit more effort and, and annoying people. And how fast was it until a bunch of people started doing the same thing and like self-distribution. Man, I don't really think it was that. I, I want to say like Tired Hands maybe was like the f the first one after us. Um, again, yeah, memory's a little foggy, yeah. but whenever Tired Hands was coming around, they were doing it self-distribution. And um, yeah, and like you said, now it's like, it seems to be like everybody's doing it. You know, they don't want to get lost in a wholesale portfolio or they don't want to, they don't want somebody else selling their beer because they don't know as much about it or, or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so we, uh, you know, fast forward to around the summer of 2007 and, uh, you know, Bill and Nancy, uh, were partners with Tom Kehoe and he, you know, owner of yards now, but they, you know, the things just kind of started to separate their ideals of how they wanted to grow the business became, you know, they just became different and Tom wanted to, you know, expand and go up and down the East coast and Bill and Nancy wanted to keep things a lot more tighter and sell more beer, more fresh beer in the Philadelphia region and Jersey and kind of things like that. And we were doing so well at the time with the self distribution that it was like, well, what we can't justify selling beer to Rhode Island if, you know, if, if Philadelphia needs it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it was still probably an unrealized market. I mean, you guys still had potential to, ton of potential to grow at that point yeah and at that time i mean there weren't as many i mean not nearly as many scrap breweries as there are now but even you know compared to like 2010 or 2009 there wasn't that many options as far as beer was concerned I mean, probably less than 200 craft breweries in the whole country at that point yeah and i mean in philly i mean you were thinking like 10 like you guys, 10 top tops street. maybe i don't know i'm trying to be uh, generous at that point yeah, but I mean, yeah there was maybe i mean 
and probably most of those places don't even exist anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that's a crazy number. Like just for perspective, we talked about this before, but there's like 160 breweries in Philly, yeah. like in the surrounding areas. Yeah, exactly. So it's like everybody, everybody's doing it and, or everybody thinks they can do it and, and then they find out they can't or they have something good and they keep rolling with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the time we were, we were really successful and they had, you know, that people were gravitating towards it. Um, so, you know, came down to like the summer of 2007 and they decided to split and, um, you know, things were, things were a little rough for a little while, um, in the summer and, um, of 2007 and I stayed on to work with yards through the rest of the year and they, and then not necessarily knowing exactly what was going to happen with Philadelphia Brewing and, you know, since Bill, Bill was the one that had hired me, yeah. um, I always respected Tom. I never had any, you know, ill will towards Tom, but um, Bill was the one that, you know, hired me, signed my yeah, checks. Yeah, you were two and, years in at this point, and it just kind of made sense. Yeah, and then so, you know, when it came down to it, Tom was nice enough to keep me on, you know, and he needed somebody to run, you know, his the, the distribution business for the rest of the year for him, and he was gracious enough to keep me on, and uh, I did what I could for him. But um, when it came to the beginning of the year, Philadelphia Brewing Company was starting anew, and I decided to go with them because I wanted to know what it was going to be like to start a brand from the ground up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, essentially my loyalty was was to Bill and to Nancy. Call and it Philadelphia Brewing Company. I exactly. Mean, it's like, like, hey, we're going to have Philadelphia Brewing Company, and people were buzzing really yeah. hard about it. And it yeah. was like, yeah, we got a really great opportunity to to do some great things here. And um, So Yards left. They moved to their new location. And then Bill and Nancy stayed at the Kensington location. Right. Uh, they, I guess Tom took the name Yards, and then Bill and Nancy kind of created this Philadelphia Brewing Company. Yeah, so from the beginning, Bill and Nancy were investors in, yeah. in Yards. So Tom always had the name and the brand rights yeah. and all that. Um, but the Kensington facility was always Bill and Nancy's. They owned the bricks, and they owned all the equipment. Yeah. So, um, you know, so Tom was going to take his uh, – take his brand, brand elsewhere but yeah. you know he needed a brewing facility i think he was down at poplar on at the where mainstay is now yeah. for a little while before they created the spring garden facility um so that was the whole thing it was like you know hey we have a whole brand new line of beers and you know it's still the same crew and all this other stuff and do you remember what the beers were then yeah first four beers were well the first one's kensinger yeah that's where the whole concept State. for everything came from State. yeah right exactly um Kensinger, Walt Witt, uh, New Bold IPA, and Row House Red. So, um, I'm sure some people listening aren't going to hear that and be like, wow, I haven't thought about that. Roadhouse Red in a bit. I just talked to my brother in law and he was like, God, are they ever going to bring that beer back? I'm like, you sound like all the other, you know, all the other guys that really want it, you know, really want that, that beer back. And you, you got to vote with your dollars. Like, if you want something, you got to buy it. It's still a business, you know, yeah. and Row House Red was a great beer. You know, maybe we'll bring it back someday. We still got, Still got the recipe, and yep. so, um, but yeah, great beer, but just didn't sell, you know, as well as, as a, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, easier, easier to make, and he's more, more approachable. Definitely. Um, and when you're running a business, especially if you're just starting one, you can't really have beers that are not selling as well. For sure. Um, so yeah, those were the first four beers, and um, you know, we were we were off and running with it, and um, making variety cases and hand mixing variety cases and. Man, those were those were the days. It's like Your fingers you, are all uh, you, you, up. you come in the morning and it's like we need three pallets of variety cases made, and people are just it's like a, a nut house. <laughs> I don't miss those days, um, but uh, but yeah. So then you know, 2008 started, and we uh, we were off and running again, and now just a clean slate, new brewery, a whole new whole new situation, and um, still it, still self distributed. So. Based off of how the brewery set up now, was it kind of laid out the same way? Brew house up on the third floor, yep. You know, with all the tanks up there, and then kind of bottling up. Yeah, yeah. There was a couple things that had changed. The the upstairs pretty much always remained the same. Like we moved a couple tanks around and things like that. Yeah. But um, downstairs, like the main floor where the bottling line was or is still is. Um, that's what got moved around a little that bit. Had some tanks in it, right? Yeah, we had some temporary tanks down there. Everything was done down there, actually. Bright tanks, the keg washing, everything. So then yeah. we started to compartmentalize some different things and move bright tanks into a different sector of the building. 
um, all keg washing, keg filling, get moved downstairs to like one section. So it was a very temporary situation. And so when we got to, when we came up with the new concept and everything, we were able to rearrange, took two months off and didn't, didn't come out with beer till March. It was like two full months of just a complete building I mean, rehab. You're creating wow. a new company at that point. Yeah, it was like we really need a whole story. fresh start, like literally fresh paint and fresh floors and the whole deal. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh that was that was interesting. It was as well. Like put it behind you also, you know, like you guys were yards and kind of yeah. like fresh start. This is exactly this is Philadelphia brewing now. Yep. You know, we're yeah. How was that period? Like just being a part of that. It was awesome. Uh I'll be honest, you know, there's a uh, you can't take you, you can't get those memories you know yeah. back or you can't you know can't get those experiences back you know you can you can do different things like you know but it was it was the time you know that that time period was like you said we were kind of really just getting started and you know the whole boom of craft beer was really everything was buzzing super hard and uh yeah it was it was wild. We had great times, you know. And you were you were a sales person at this time, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was always kind of like um, I always had the sales title, you know, at, at that time. But it was at you know everybody had to do everything, and that was always a, a you know that's always been a motto of ours is you always have to be able to do everything. You know, the only thing I can't do there is brew. Yeah. <laughs> so I've never brewed. And, and you guys are, I mean, I was yeah. there for a couple of years. I mean, you guys do yeah. everything. If there's an issue, you guys aren't finding anyone else. Bill yeah. figures out how to do it and someone's doing it there. And there's a lot, you know, and there's a lot to be said about that. It's it's frustrating, you know, because it's like, well, I just want to go in and do my job and do this. But like, oh, the elevator broke and <laughs> forklift didn't start. And, you know, you got to somebody, everybody's got to work on it together. It's yeah, like, you know, it's always like grass is greener on the other side. And there's like someone sitting in a cubicle and like, what do they want to do? They want to. Correct. Come on. It's like every day is new there. It's mm -hmm. like there's always something happening. Yeah. It sounds like a startup mentality all the time. Which is a fun sort of environment. Yeah. If you you're know, up for the task. Exactly. You know, when you get to 18 years, it gets, you know, like there's things that can, <laughs> you would think wouldn't, wouldn't happen again, but you know, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So what was, what was being a salesperson like back then? I mean, were you, it, it was so early in craft beer. Were you still having to explain to people what craft beer was or you were kind of like, I mean, Kensinger is craft beer but it's kind of like a more approachable craft beer where it's like a right you could sell it almost as like an alternative to Bud Light or something like that yeah um it 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 was tough because you had your hardcore macro drinkers who just wouldn't steer away from Miller Light or Bud Light or anything like that so it was which like, I would say a lot of the places that Philadelphia Brewing is sold, especially Kensinger, right. is the bars that still haven't, I mean, you guys are in all, all the craft breweries, but also, like, you guys are, like, such a staple in these places that, like, people just drink Miller Lite and Kensinger. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to, to touch on that, it was, um, you know, we have a great presence in Philly, like, you know, we're like the underground Philly beer, you yeah. know, and with a name like Philadelphia Brewing, everybody's like, well, you guys, like, why aren't you guys bigger or all this other stuff, and it's like, well, we're mom and pop owned, you know, there's yeah. no, there's no big group of investors. There's no super huge board. It's like, you know, we all, we all pitch in and we make it work. Yeah. Also, I think a lot of people don't realize how much beer you guys make. It's yeah. like, I think you're so close to it, but I think like people like look at Kensinger and be like, yeah, I've heard of that. But like Kensinger is in almost every bar. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, um, I mean, you personally have probably sold a hundred thousand barrels of Kensington, which is like wild to say. That's a good, like that's a good question, but yeah, it's most like, likely. It's insane the amount of Kensington that you've sold. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at that because now I'm in, I'm curious. But yeah, uh, it's been a lot, man. I mean, I, uh, you know, being, you know, in the sales, in beer sales at that time was just, it was great, you know, because you get to, you get to walk in anywhere and people are really happy to see the beer guy, you know. Um, Did you guys have the tap handles at that point? Because like, I know... I mean, we do have Philadelphia Brewing does have cool tap handles like the custom. Oh yeah, we were making them from the start, you know. So yeah, we make all our own custom tap handles. Um, you know, really? some I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, so the Walt yeah, have you ever yeah. seen the pencil? Yeah. yeah. That's like the pencils that like your teacher would buy. Like they're you know, like, like actual pencils. Yeah, it's, it's like an actual <laughs> pencil that erases. It just doesn't have the graphite. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was you know we had to do so many quirky little things you know when you're when you're a startup and you're trying to you know do the best with the resources that you have 
and we found some kind of goofy, you know, novelty magazine, and we're like, look at these big pencils, and um, we had a guy at the time, uh, Tyson, uh, he, uh, he was like our head tap handle uh, guru kind of at that do, point. Doer of everything. Yeah, this, the, <laughs> what, what that guy could do with anything, it was just, he had he just the such a creative. He's the coolest machine in my entire life. Yeah, so he, <laughs> he's, uh, they re recently moved to New Mexico, so oh, wow. good okay, for him. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so he was like, oh, I've got, I can put like, I can just put like a ferrule on that and like make it work. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're just seeing these huge pencils like pop up at bars and some bars liked it. Some people didn't cause it was like, this thing's too big and it's all ridiculous, but it sold beer. You know what I mean? It was yeah. people just walking up and be like, what's the pencil? I didn't even care what it was. It's like, uh, so yeah, that, that was always a fun part was like making the tap handles and coming out with new beers and, um, it's figuring funny. out what the you tap handle is going to be. You guys yeah. have been around for so long that, you know, everybody needed a tap handle and you guys were making them. And now in the last like, you know, five, 10 years, it's almost like people don't have tap handles because now a lot of bars just have like the little snub things. Mm -hmm. Oh but yeah. Now it's, it's almost come full circle where now like everyone was like trying to differentiate themselves. Now, like you're seeing these craft breweries come out with these unique tap handles. Yeah. Because Again, and they're, yeah. they're like reinventing what you guys made. Well, yeah, 15, it was 20 like years ago. You had to differentiate yourself. I mean, the the idea behind the individual tap handles was, you know, we wanted to steer away from things that yards, what we were known with with yards, yeah. mm -hmm. which was, you know, people would just come up to the bar and like, let me get a yards, and you didn't even know what it was, whether it was the IPA or the Philly Pale or whatever. It was just, you know, hey, it this is different. A, yeah, it was just like, well, it wasn't differentiated. Like there was no like. But it was different individual than like brand. Right. They were just ordering yards. Right. Yeah. I meant like how the how the tap handles made it like an individual brand. So okay, it's like yeah. okay, well, I know that that's Walt Whit. Yeah. Um, you know, the reverse side of that is we would have trouble with people recognizing that we were Philadelphia Brewing. So it was like, oh, you guys make Kensinger and Walt Whit. Oh, okay. I didn't know that because everything was so uniform. Because everybody would say, oh, well, Victory Brewing Company's thing or so-and-so Yards Brewing Company's beer. So we were always trying to be known as, like, Kensinger. And, yep. you know, because the big picture behind that was, you know, take, like, Sam Adams, for instance. You don't go in and order a, a Boston Beer Company Sam Adams blogger, you know. So yeah. it was, that was that was always, like, you know, the, the, the whole situation behind that. Yeah, and, I, like, to that point... Like when I learned Kensinger was from Philadelphia Brewing, that kind of surprised me for the first time. People think it's its own yeah. brand. I mean, it's its own monster. Yeah, I mean, I you know over the years we've tooled with like coming out with other sub genres under the Kensinger name itself. Um, still love to do that, like a Kensinger Dark or a Kensinger October Fest or anything like that, yeah. like making its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so there was, that was always like the reasoning behind it. So we wanted to separate ourselves from, you know, being under the umbrella of another brewery. When did, when did Commonwealth Cider become a thing? Was that from the beginning? Yeah, I think it's going to, that, no, that didn't come out till 2011. Okay. And, um, I still remember that first batch we did it with champagne yeast and it was like the driest thing I had ever <laughs> had. And I was like, wow, I'm blown away. Like it was, it was so good because- yeah. We yet again we saw like another, you know, portion of the market that was totally untouched, you know, by anybody like any local craft cideries yeah. or anything like this. And the only options you had were Strongbow, Magners, and then Angry Orchard came out. Yeah. And we were like, Angry Orchard is just basically soda. It's just so much sugar and <laughs> it was just disgusting and you know, don't care it still is no, so I, I like I, yeah no i agree with you dry cider is the way to go yeah so you know 2011 we came out with the cider and um that's been going really well for us i mean a lot people love the dry you know only one gram of sugar so people love I the dry it's awesome. style it's like every single time it's exactly the same it's it, like yeah it drinks like a white wine you know yeah. and it's like people drink it and they're like oh i don't usually like cider but i can drink this you know yeah um and i think that's you know a big Thing with what we do even with our beers is everything's very approachable and you know when it comes down to it you're you're thinking of people who start a brewery don't necessarily think like it's a business you still have to run a business and you still have to employ people and pay you know pay their salaries and all these different things so you can come out with all the hypey you know you know beers that you want but 
unless you keep that train rolling, which to me seems extremely expensive. Like you, there's no brand loyalty it or time. it's like yeah. people, this is going to come off wrong, but like people don't think of Philadelphia brewing as like the hype or this cool new brewery. Uh, yeah. But you guys have been around for 15, 20 years and it's kind and of look at all these other places that have flared up and yeah. gone out of business. We're they might still be cool here for one or two years. Yeah. And here's Philadelphia brewing always there. We're still here bar doing the same thing putting out the same, you know, five, six beers every single year, you know, and look, it's, it's a successful business. Yeah, it's, and, it's it works. Ki- and it's kind of funny, too, because there's a lot of styles that we've come out with over the years that turned into, like, oh, my God, like, we did the Joe Coffee Porter. Um, kind of a funny story behind that. It's named Joe because of uh, Joe Badia from Pizzeria Badia. Um, he had this funny idea. He used to brew for yards. So that's where we know Joe from. I've known Joe since 05. Um, Joe's awesome. He is exactly who you think he is. Um, that Bill told me a story one time <laughs> that yeah. he told, he said Joe would uh, brew beer in four hours. And like, <laughs> you, like <laughs> you physically cannot brew beer in four hours. And Joe was just like, uh, like, yeah, like, I just know where to, like, cut the corners. But I think he was, like, already focused on pizza at that point. Yeah. But, like, you physically cannot brew beer in four hours. But yeah. he would, like, be done brew days in four hours. I'm like. <laughs> yeah, Joe Joe had his own way of doing things. And it seems like he's still doing his own thing today, and which is great. And he's working now. Yeah. So he had this funny idea to come up with to put coffee and beer and we're like what are you talking about and be like oh coffee porter and now that's like such a and now exactly and we came thing. out with joe in 09 and it's like you know so was it always with uh was it Paceros? i can't remember if we started with Paceros, but yeah it's been Paceros for a oh, long wow. time another local uh roastery and yeah. um i think they're based in port richmond still yeah. um what's the secret what's the next trends that's the real question <laughs> I don't know, man. I'll be completely <laughs> honest. I think, you know, everybody's been doing, you know, obviously loggers and, you know, uh, are just been a mainstay recently. And I think everybody just got sick of the same haze bomb and all that different stuff. And certain styles have, you know, solidified themselves. Obviously, like everybody needs a, a hazy IPA now on their tap list or different styles of IPAs. Um, but, uh, you know, beard. Beer's, you know, we can all say it and be honest, beer's taking a little bit of a hit. Everybody's drinking seltzers and teas and all that different stuff. Um, But I think, you know, there's something to be said for good, consistent, you know, brands that have stood the test of time and something you can depend on. You know, I, it was, it was terrible when you can't, now that you can't go into a beer store and get an Anchor Steam anymore. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that have never had one and now they won't be able to. And that's, that's a shame from some, something that was, you know, a benchmark in craft beer. And it's sad to see things like that and, and people not appreciating, you know, where, you know, the people who started, you know, these, this whole situation. Um, so as far as like, what's next, I mean, people have been asking what's next all the time. And then it's like, you know, I think the people that don't last, are looking at everybody else saying what's next what's next and the yeah let's stay even if they're making new beer all the time they're they're making that decision on themselves and like you know philadelphia brewing is not looking at what other people are doing all the time like they're focused on what they're doing and look at it's working yeah. you know it's like it might not be like what's next it's just like focus on what you're doing and make your own brand you don't have to copy everybody else the people that are copying everybody else are inevitably going to burn out yeah you can't always just be chasing the dragon yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I think there's something to be said for, you know, consistent brands that have been in the market for a while and, you know, we're going to keep making it because people keep drinking it. So, and I got to have a paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think Kensington is ever going to die. No. It's like you walk into like any city bar stable. in the city, doesn't matter where it is. Not as long as, uh, not as long as those lights are still on, that yeah. beer will still be getting pumped out. Yeah. So, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I can feel confident saying that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, as a salesperson, Mm -hmm. um, a little bit different than, you know, like, you know, we're going to have a lot of brewers on this, but sales is a little bit different. You know, you guys are making calls, you guys are selling beer to people, and then um, you guys are going out and actually delivering the beer. You know, that means in Center City, you're taking an 18-foot truck. Yeah. Trying to find a parking spot, hauling kegs, bringing it down the basement. People don't think about this stuff in beer and, like, this is what... 
is what it takes. Yeah, when you're a self-distributed brewery, I mean, you got to do everything. And, um, you know, we try to be as flexible as possible with our customers. And, you know, if somebody... Uh, I mean, you were just saying before we got on, like, uh, who was it? McGillens was hitting you up, like, yesterday. And, like, we need beer today. And it's like... Sometimes it will be, you know. Yeah, it was like... Uh, you call, we I call. had to go back. I had to go down in Center City anyway. And then it was just so happened before I left. Like, they were like, hey, we'll take this this week. I'm like, well, why don't I give it to you today? And they're like, that's great. And, you know... I mean, today you were at what? You were at... Uh, yeah, so I was at Johnny Brenda's, uh, then... Um, Center City went to McGillan's and yeah. Oscars and yeah and then did a and sales appointment at the new Barcade so yeah so it's like you gotta be able to it's so what, what you're really you're managing beer coming out of the brewery and then you're all over the city visiting these people at their bars yeah you get you know um, it's I mean you're you've been doing it for so long it probably feels natural to you like if I were to, to go to all the four of those places in one day I would come home and take a nap you know? yeah yeah there's um there's uh there's definitely a knack to it I mean what really changed for me was uh along with a, a whole bunch of other things but with the company as well was when COVID hit and we went from a staff of about 25 to 30 people down to like five and they kept me on because I was there the longest and I knew what it was like to, you know, deliver the I beer mean, and sell the beer. And essential employees, you are essential. I mean, that, you know, so, so I took basically the entire wholesale operation on myself and um, it was really scary, you know, because you're, I'm going all around places and I'm still coming home to my wife and, and uh, trying to make sure we don't get sick and all this other stuff. Yeah. But um, I became this one man band and, that just helped me to to really prioritize my time and um, get you know see a whole different side of the business with the logistics and the deliveries and all this other different things. I mean, I can tell you what what times like loading zones are on certain streets and where is the best time to park and you know uh, sometimes if there's going to be a parking authority there or not. You know, like <laughs> or when's the best time to deliver to somebody. You know, so yeah, it's like, like all those little nuances that really like come into come into play like you don't want to be in center city city. at five o'clock like you're just gonna sit there yeah (laughs) it's been one of the craziest like places or maybe not places but one of the harder deliveries or something like i'm sure you see so much shit all the time yeah i mean you know i won't name any names but there's definitely places out there that are not as accessible um you know delivering beer and putting kegs in basements is it's hard work and a lot of it is not safe um, I mean, you're dropping a lot of like they, you're dropping them down the stairs, and they have like the wooden shoots that just drop on the tires. Yeah, and they're having to haul up kegs. You yeah, know, it's, I mean, it's you crazy. know, floors that aren't concrete. They're you know, or it's just like you know, you're you're coming into some of these basements that are still the same way that the bar was when it opened in the '60s McGillen's or whenever. Like built in 18. I mean, not that McGillan's has these issues, but McGillan's is yeah. Like well, let's take McGillan's old. for example. Yeah. You know, so they have a good setup because, and it's it's funny because I was just there today, but you know, they've been. Uh, you know, they started that bar in 1860, so yeah. it doesn't look like 1860 down there. Yeah. But the way you deliver it is you have these two horse ropes that you wrap around the keg and then guide it down a rail. And when, if anybody's ever been to McGillan's, yeah. it's it's a party there nonstop, no yeah. matter what time of the day. So right now, especially during holiday time, people are coming out and they're like, whoa, what's going on here? And it's like people start videoing me and all this other stuff. It's like, no pressure. Don't drop that keg, you know. So, um, you know, yeah, thankfully uh, there's there hasn't been um, anybody that's you know gotten seriously injured or anything like that. Uh, pulled my back out a few times and, and had some close calls. Yeah. But, you know, you just, top priority is to try to be as safe as Definitely. possible. Yeah. But um yeah, there's definitely some terrible basements out there and places that I will not eat because I know what the kitchen looks like. So I won't mention any names. I'll keep that to myself. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, as far as the whole sales thing goes, um, I think it's just, you know, everything is continuing to evolve and change, especially in this industry, no matter what. I think right now is also a huge you know, time of uncertainty. There's a lot of big breweries that are having problems, a lot of small breweries, a lot of mid, mid-range mid breweries that are really seeing, you know, problems as well too financially. And, um, you know, but I think a, a big portion of it is if you have the resources, no matter what size you are, just keep continuing on and pressing on and, and weather the storm that there's going to be breweries that fall out and there's going to be ones that succeed and that's just business, you know? Definitely. And um, people keep, you know, 
they don't say it to me as much now because they, I think they know, but people used to ask me all the time, well, when's the bubble going to burst? And I just kept saying, I'm like, it burst, guys. You just haven't seen the fallout yet. Like, yeah. it's done. Like, There's a lot of breweries that are closing right now. And, I, yeah. you know, COVID put a lot of pressure on people. And then the bailouts, like, everyone was like, oh, free money now. And then they started spending money like idiots. Mm -hmm. And now that, like, the economy kind of sucks, it's like, you know, people aren't selling as much anymore. And, like, the people that were smart and kind of kept to their guns and did what, you know, worked and what they knew what their business was good at right you know the ones that are going to survive and like unfortunately a lot of people are going to go out of business i don't think it's the bubble bursting i think it's just people made some bad decisions and you know a lot of the people that made deci bad decisions are going to kind of get yeah i guess i guess it was kind of more or less like you know the bubble bursting as far as like going into the beer store and i don't even reckon my recognize half the uh the cans that are on the shelf and yeah. i'm like i don't even know who these people are yeah mm -hmm. and it's like and to me it used to be like you'd go to the bottle shop you know, at the end of the week and be like, oh, well, what's the new beer that's out? And then, and then now it's like, oh, well, the, the, this is some other new brewery or whatever. And then, you know, $200 later, you're like, well, I can't do that every week. Exactly. So what do <laughs> yeah. they fall back on? Kensinger. Yeah. They fall back on what they know. And, yeah. you know, and something a little bit different than just a Miller Lite, but it's not, you know, some crazy thing that they have no idea what it's going to taste like. Cause there's, there's so much inconsistency with a lot of these new breweries right. that they don't, there people are spending like twenty dollars, twenty four dollars for a four pack, and you have no idea what you're gonna get. Yeah, and I I think you know uh, people want to they they depend on something that they know. They also want to support something local. You know that's still a huge thing that people believe in and supporting local products. Um, you know you can you can come to the brewery and ask people about you know our our brewery and about the beers and all these different things. You know so it's involved in the community. It's like yeah, every, you guys are so in, intertwined with that whole area. And that was always a huge thing that Bill and Nancy wanted to try to convey was that you know we have to be part of the community because these are the people that are supporting us. So you know we can't just be sitting here you know not involved with things and they genuinely wanted to be involved and that brewery is a cornerstone of that neighborhood and i mean you see the people that like you know the people that have lived here before the gentrification they support philadelphia brewing they yeah. support kensinger they support yeah. all of the commonwealth cider and it's like yeah. a testament to what you guys have been doing from the beginning yeah we have a great you know a great local following and um and like i said that that the building and the brewery itself is a cornerstone of the neighborhood and what we were saying before is the kensington area was not great and it wasn't safe and um even before i got there you know they were they they got that building in 2000 so um it was even you know worse back then so it's uh it's come a long way and you know it's a it, there's something to be said about longevity especially with you know a, a, a community oriented brewery like like we have definitely and i mean i mean look at it now it's like you guys we just talked about joe badia before and now he's a part of Define Hospitality, like probably one of the top three, if not one of the most, you know, celebrated restaurant groups in the whole city right now. Yeah. And they're opening up a giant, fancy oyster bar, natural wine bar directly across the street from the brewery. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a restaurant group Disneyland over there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Martha Street is about to be crazy next summer. Yeah, uh, we don't really know exactly what to expect, but we know it's going to be good. Gonna be I mean, there. yeah, there's going to be a lot of people, so um, we might have to. I might have to get a. Uh, <laughs> I might have to quit my job and open a parking lot. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, we're real excited about that, and it's it's cool to see that building actually get used for something other than torn down and put more condos up that are crappy and an yeah, eyesore. Nice. They reserved the, or saved the whole outside. Yeah, the entire outside walls. And it matches your brewery. I mean, it, yeah. it used to be one brewery, the Weisboro Heiss. Uh, yeah, the Weisboro and Hess. Weisbrod and Hess. Um, so, the, yeah, our our building was originally a brewery back in uh, 1885. And uh, unfortunately, due to prohibition, they, they shut it down in around 1933. And it became like a storage warehouse for, like, supermarket equipment or something for a while and then it just sat there until uh late 90s early 2000s and uh yeah like i said that was before me but bill came in and they did a they did a ton of renovation on that brewery i think so it's it was called the what weisberg and hess uh yeah oriental bill oriental, oriental brewery. brewery yeah because back in the day you know something that was oriental 
was fancy sounding. Yeah, it was like prestigious. prestigious. Yeah, exactly. And they had like the peacock, so that's why you have the peacock room as the name of the tasting room. Yeah, it's like yeah. Kind of going along with that. And yeah, it was like the peacock was like their um was like their main logo, and they yeah. even had like a peacock beverages like uh, I think it was like a soda line, mm-hmm. like soft drink line. Um, but yeah, where where that the Soraya building is going to be, that's that was all part of our. We never owned that building, but it was all part of the main complex that housed the Weisbrot and Hess um, brewery, and it was two German immigrants who came over and just really, really, really went for it. And uh, it's cool because you still see like. You can go downstairs in the basement, like underneath, um, you know, underneath the main floors, and see like a lot of the old stuff that was down there still. Like, yeah, and you guys have like a lot of the pictures, like the yeah, Christmas pictures and stuff. The yeah, pictures like that are holding up like dead deer in their company portraits. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they used to have they used to have their own game reserve like up in like northern Pennsylvania. So it was like you know back when the days of like you you just had you know free range of everything. Yeah. So it was like. Yeah, there's there's still some of the old pictures from the original pictures from the brewery. I think if a craft brewery in Philadelphia were to post Christmas pictures with a big <laughs> dead like slaughtered deer, yeah, I don't think that they'd be selling too much beer. Yeah, it would be uh, it'd be interesting. <laughs> that changed. that would be yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, there's there's definitely a lot of stuff happening. Um, there's there's good things happening all over the place, you know. So we're we're really looking forward to it. That's for sure. Yeah. So where are you finding yourselves most now? Like, are you still out on the road? Where? where are you, yeah. So I mean, look like now. Yeah. So I, I mean, like I said, I handle the entire wholesale operation. You know, we've had to pare back on you know certain things. Like we're not as prevalent like outside the city as we used to be. Um, we but have, I think a lot of breweries are doing that. Like e, everyone's kind of like taking their footprint, like just focusing. More yeah. Better. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, you know, backyard. we had to, we had to shift a lot of things and priorities, you know, to the, to the brewery itself, to the actual, like to getting people in the door to the bar at the brewery, to the Peacock Room. Um, and then, you know, we hired a wonderful woman by the name of Angela Ricci, who handles all of our private events. And we turned what used to just be our tasting room upstairs for tours. Like we'd get, you know, hundreds of people on tour days. Uh, you know, we do tours every Saturdays. Now we just do tours on every third Saturday. Um, but, you know, we turned that whole that whole thing into an event space upstairs. So There's it's weddings all the time. Now. Yeah, weddings, you know, uh, private parties, holiday. Right now it's holiday parties every all, all the time. Yeah, and you know, yeah, uh, Angie and Nancy like so uh, decorate that place like crazy. Oh yeah, you know it's <laughs> it's it's uh there's there's definitely something always going on. But uh, they you know so we had a shift to that to you know selling pints out the front door because you know a big a big portion of our business was gone due to COVID and you know it's it's definitely come back you know I mean, not that, the the bread and butter of philadelphia brewing was kensinger and kegs to all these bars that yeah now could not sell beer right and a lot of those places weren't selling to go beers you know these were philly dive bars yeah i mean i had to you know during that whole time i had to try to go back out outside of the city because the restrictions were different um try to sell beer outside of the city and it was mostly it's a whole nother game i mean the last time you were doing that was yeah you know, 2005, 2010. Yeah. And I, yeah, I was like, hey, I'm back. They're like, yeah. we haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, but, you know, once things started to switch, but, you know, now it's it's different. I mean, we still have a great, you know, uh, foothold in, you know, with Kensinger in city bars all over the place. But, I mean, there is a lot more healthy competition out there as far as, you know, people making great beer and it's, and it's great. But, you know, you got, you know, the likes, obviously, Yards, but, you know, the likes of Love City and, you um, human robot everybody's doing you know great beers at this point especially you know things that compete with kensinger on the pilsers yeah. and the lager side on the lager side of things um so yeah i mean it's a challenge no matter what but you know we've built such a great um customer base that are super loyal to us and you know we keep them happy and then you know do our best to whoever's coming out new you know do our best to get our foot in the door over there as well too but um but yeah, I mean, we have customers that have that have been with us since day one. So it's like, it's that's you know few, few and far between to have a tap handle for fifteen plus years, especially in this industry. So yeah, we got to be doing something right. I mean, there's there's, you know, there's probably only fifty breweries across the country that have been around craft breweries that have been around like that consider themselves craft breweries that have been around for the last eighteen twenty years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean. um, 
like anything else, it comes with its challenges. I mean, there's going to be ups and downs, industry changes, and you know. But if you can try to stay as consistent as possible, then that's that's what we try to do. You know, especially with our service. I think um, going back to what it means to be a salesperson, it's like I'm never not on call. You know, and I have some people that will shoot me a text at like three o'clock in the morning after they get done their shift or close the bar. Hey, I need this tomorrow. And I'm like, that's fine. You know, reach out to me. I might not get back to you at three in the morning, but, <laughs> um, you know, I always try to be as available as possible because that gives me a little bit of a leg up on the big guys. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm, if I'm able to sneak in, if somebody's like, oh, well, I'm only here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or I don't, you know, you have to order a certain amount of beer and we're only in this area every other week, mm-hmm. you know, we've, uh, we've benefited a lot from that, you know, and just being a consistent presence for people to, to rely on. So, yeah, definitely. I also uh, want to give a quick shout out. My first beer I made was Working Cat. Oh, yeah. That's uh, is also the name. I'm most proud of the name. <laughs> but it's true. The, the work you guys do with the SPCA and like kind of everything that you guys do with cats in the city is like kind of unmatched. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of people. I mean, we just had Allison on with the dog bar, but like right. the cats are kind of the same monster and Philly and you know Nancy and kind of everything that you guys do yeah I mean Nancy she really um that's that's her baby I mean she really I can't take any credit for that I mean I'm always trying to be there to you know to spread the cat love and all that stuff but that's that's her full passion I mean she really loves it and um you know she she helps to rescue cats all over the city and find homes for them. So we do a lot of work with the SPCA. I mean, I think uh, it's just super authentic. It's like, you know, all these craft breweries, everyone's got to have their own thing. Everyone's got to have their own brand. And you guys have stayed true to who you guys are the entire time. And then every brewery also has to have like a social cause that they're connected to. It's just the fact that matter it. And you guys have found something that is like genuinely, truly PBC. Yeah. And you guys have like stuck to it throughout the years. And you guys are genuinely making a difference. It's it. cool because you see other, you know, we're not the first people to, you know, have cats in the brewery or anything. So you see other people kind of making it more well known at other breweries or, are, you know, are capitalizing off it a little bit more. But, yeah, but Duke's the OG. Yeah, so Duke is the uh, he is the OG. Um, he's our working cat, so uh, he's he's our resident cat that tours the brewery and finds pests and all that different kind of thing. And um, you know, we've added to the family as well too. So we've come out with a, a line of cat uh, themed beer. So we have the working cat, we have the black cat, which is so right. all, and then <laughs> yeah, um, and then another one's called Space Cowboy. So we have a, a, a cat that looks like a cow, so we call him Cowboy. Um, so it's fun. I mean, and you know, you get people that are interested in it and it's like, you know, you have to have some kind of little spin these days to separate yourself from everybody else. So I'm like, you know, as a salesperson, it's like, well, whatever, let's just go with the cat thing. You know, it'll, it's, yeah. it'll be, you know, we can, we can partner with, you know, philanthropy and do something good and, you know, make some great beers at the same time. So yeah, it's, it's been fun. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, one of the best parts of working at Philadelphia Brewing, obviously, yeah, I yeah. love working there. <laughs> but Bill and Nancy make you lunch every day. Yeah, <laughs> uh, literally make lunch in the kitchen for you every single day. Yeah, and it's then, uh, it's it was always you know, it's it's not so much anymore because okay. we're so much more pared yeah. down. But uh, the um, you know they. That was always a motto, and everybody felt like family. They treat they treat all their employees I mean, family like family. Lunch every day. They make yeah, it, everyone stops what they're doing. They go eat lunch. Yep. Um, honestly, when I first started working there, you know, I was not used to eating vegetarian food, and like ninety percent <laughs> of what they make is vegetarian. Yeah, Richie was like, uh, "I'm gonna go get a cheesesteak," and I'm yeah, like, yeah. "He's like, I can't exist off of yeah, this, this," no and I was like, soup. "I hear you." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was uh, but yeah, it was always like you know it always brought everybody together and it was good, you know, to sit down and kind of go over what was, you know, take a break from everything. And you then take a break. And then you have the four cats in there, you know, cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Everybody's hanging out. Yeah. Going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, um, it's cool. It's, it's always been a great, you know, you know, morale builder and a lot of camaraderie come off of that. Some really good ideas for beers and have come out of those lunch meetings. Definitely. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Where can we follow you guys? You got anything to plug? Any events or anything? I know you guys do open mics and stuff. Uh, yeah, so we got um, just go to Philadelphia Brewing on on Instagram. That's where we have most of our our uh, events. You know, up to date events. Um, uh, great, our, our great PR firm, uh, Punch Media. Um, they know them very well. Yeah, yep. Kylie, uh, she she kicks ass, and um, she the does same it. way that you know everyone. 
in the bar scene. I feel like Kylie knows everyone as well. She does, yeah. Yeah, we make a great team. Um, but yeah, they do a great job for us. So uh, check out uh, at Philadelphia Brewing. And, um, you know, we do food trucks and, yeah, weekly uh, open mic on every Wednesday. Cool. Um, and then... Uh, I remember we had a Rick and Morty event. Yeah. That was crazy. I didn't know some of you were in love with Rick and Morty. But I didn't had, either. Like, Did you guys have the truck? Yeah, the, 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 the truck pulled up and everybody up. went out of control. And then, yeah. uh, who was it? Uh, the Aardvark Felon? Yeah, Frank. Was yeah, playing my like, custom songs from the show. It yeah, was, that yeah, was a crazy event. Yeah, so Frank <laughs> is the host for the open mic. It's yeah. uh, whiskey unplugged. Yeah, and um, so they still do that every Wednesday. So and they get a great crowd for that on Wednesdays. And then yeah, things just change. Um, we'll have uh, you know, Cat or Day with Cat Adoptions. I think it's every third Saturday of the of the month. Um, so there's always some cool stuff going on. Um, I yeah. mean, there's cool stuff, and I think just the yeah, the ceiling is like. There is no roof for you guys right now. I mean, I think the whole neighborhood is, like, so exciting right now. That new restaurant coming in. I think that, you know, Philadelphia Brewing is just getting started. I think this this next summer is going to be crazy for you guys. I'm looking forward and, to like, it. Your yeah. beer garden now is so cool. Yeah, we got the space of all the beer gardens. So, um, and, and now it's like we transitioned into the winter months. But So we have this whole patio that's all heated so people can it come in so there. It was so nice. When we went, the other, we went re pretty recently. Oh, cool, yeah. And it was so nice outside. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's like such a fun space. It's real nice, yeah. In. And it yeah. feels like you're at a brewery. It's not like yeah. some, you know, brand new fancy place. Like It mm -hmm. feels like you're at a brewery. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think that's the one cool part about where we are in the building that we have is it has this – has its own character to the building itself um and you know no offense to anybody who's in one but it's like it's not in an, in an industrial park like you know it's <laughs> this is not just hey have some tanks it's and, in a brewery and it, from 1860 it's it's a legit brewery yeah i mean and it's you know that's something to be said too is that we're still using it for its original purpose so um super proud of that and super proud of the work that we continue to do so um looking forward to keeping it moving nice well i'm yes. excited to Keep having Kensinger wherever yeah. you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll keep putting in the basement for you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, Philadelphia Brewing on Instagram. And yeah. then uh, you can follow us at Brewdat and at the Brewdat Podcast on Instagram and every social media. Cool. Yeah.